any message there. Okay, so now we are recording. Okay, so um, today I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker for um, February's webinar. Um, we have Dr. Nika Fury, um, who is a PhD, and today she will be talking about how to break into the MSL role and how to define success um, as an MSL. So um, Nika Fury received her PhD in molecular and cell biology from Baylor College of Medicine in 2021, after which she transitioned to a um, medical science liaison role at Almira. Um, Dr. Fury has been working as a medical science liaison uh, uh, after she moved to Janssen, and currently she's working as an MSL at um, Sanofi, uh, which she started at the end of last year. She's covered several therapeutic areas and looks forward to sharing her experiences across a few different positions um, as an MSL. So with that, uh, I'd love to hand over the mic to um, Nika. We'd start with this first question of just if you can explain to us um, a little bit more about your background and your um, kind of what led you to the path of medical affairs. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, just uh, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, I listened to a bunch of webinars like this when I was trying to break into the role. So I'm really glad that you're taking the time to really, you know, uh, connect with other MSLs and uh, hear what they have to say. So uh, as you said, I'm Nika Fury. Uh, I'm a PhD by background, uh, completed my PH PhD at Baylor and my lab actually moved during my grad school. So uh, I finished it at Duke. Um, and after that, I uh, immediately transitioned into the MSL role. I started out at a pretty small company called Almiral, and then I transitioned to um, Janssen after that. And for family reasons, I actually had to relocate. So I'm currently at Sanofi, which is a really great company. So uh, definitely happy to be here. Um, just currently I'm in training, um, so just started the role. But yeah, uh, very happy to share any insights. And, um, you know, I'm here for you. This is not uh, certainly uh, for me to hear myself speak. So if you have questions, just uh, type it into the chat and let's just have an open discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we, we really encourage this to be um, as interactive as possible. So um, yeah, we can have some questions to guide us, but please feel free to um, interrupt and, and um, kind of carry whatever specific questions you might have. Um, okay, and so uh, as we move to um, kind of going into how you transitioned into the role and broke into the role, what aspects about the role um, made it clear that this was going to be the right career path for you? Were there certain um, moments uh, during your kind of graduate training that uh, really highlight for yourself about what you knew you were going to do next and, and how, how did that align with the MSL role? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, when you're in graduate school, that's the perfect time to ask yourself, you know, what could you really enjoy doing for the next few decades, right? You want to make all that education in your 20s worth it. So um, do be honest with yourself and, you know, uh, make sure to explore a lot of uh, careers in graduate school. But for me, so the way that um, it all happened, so I was in the process of my qualifying exam. It was the second year of graduate school. Um, and I just started looking into industry careers. I kind of knew um, going into graduate school that I would eventually uh, transition to industry. So before grad school, I actually worked at GSK for a year and I really enjoyed that experience. And what I realized is that I'm very passionate about presenting. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed talking to people and um, uh, having those scientific discussions. And I knew that I did not want a bench-based role. Um, so that kind of uh, really helped me figure out that, you know, an MSL and a dynamic role like that would be perfect for me. And what I did uh, while in graduate school, so I started an MSL club at Baylor College of Medicine, and that experience really um, allowed me to connect with a lot of other MSLs that eventually became my mentors. And um, 
I just, um, you know, learning about the role really uh, sort of confirmed my passion for it. And that's something that definitely I would advise you to do, to do a lot of, you know, research and connecting before trying to transition. Excellent. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah, I think I personally have um, kind of partaken in activities in um, that MSL club. And so I think it's a, a wonderful um, opportunity to find community and uh, keep networking and, and learning from people, uh, different people's perspectives. So I encourage all audience members to utilize this webinar platform to reach out to speakers, to, to talk during um, the actual event. I think that's a, a wonderful way to, to keep engaged. So we have um, one question that came in from an audience member. Do you see an ability for people to transfer from industrial sales positions to the MSL position? So I definitely have seen, you know, people transition from pharmaceutical sales to an MSL. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, super common, but there's there are definitely similarities between um, the commercial side and the medical side of things, especially when it comes to a field based role. Um, so the one of the, you know, that might actually be a question that comes up in your interview as an MSL, how will you work with sales? Um, so there are some differences uh, between the commercial side and the medical side. So um, a pharmaceutical sales rep uh, can only talk on label, meaning that um, so the products prescribing information that you know you find in those um, in the packets when you open up a, a drug. So um, uh, and the medical side of things, they, we can actually uh, talk off label reactively, but but we can. So um, th th those are sort of the differences. Um, and of course, you're not in any way promotional. You're an unbiased source of information for those providers. So as long as you communicate that, that you know, you're very well aware of compliance when you're interviewing, um, I actually think, you know, a previous sales position can just be sort of an asset for you because it's a field-based position and something that when you transition to an MSL, you know, you'll learn um, a lot of things that uh, you actually might not have known in graduate school when it comes to travel and being in the field. I know a lot of the times, you know, travel for work might seem glamorous, but it, it takes a lot of adjusting as well. So um, if you were a sales representative before, then that sort of tells the uh, person who's interviewing you that you know how to nav navigate that. So any sort of position I think that you've had before, you just need to figure out a way how to turn it into advantage for you. So um, I think it's definitely possible though. Excellent, that's really good to hear. Um, we have another question about, uh, in general, talking about how to break into the MSL role without prior experience. Obviously, they're always looking for um, previous years of MSL experience, but you have to start somewhere. So what is your best piece of advice in, in navigating that process? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really glad that question came up. So uh, when you're interviewing, every time, you know, the hiring manager will have sort of a checklist in their mind. And certainly one of the things on the check the checklist will be previous MSL experience. If you do not have that, that's okay. There's a bunch of other items on the checklist. So something that they might look for is prior industry experience. And um, with that, um, any sort of work in industry counts, any collaboration during your research project, um, internships, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a specific position that you um, did in industry. It can be how you worked with industry in the past, and I'm sure you can um, figure something out there. Uh, also, what's really important is clinical experience. So uh, definitely that's something that I look for uh, MS being an MSL, of course, it's such a patient focused career, right? So you need to show that you've at least tried to uh, gain some sort of clinical experience. Uh, examples might include shadowing a provider in your institution for just a couple of days or a few weeks. Uh, so that's something I did during grad school, and I think it really helped me. 
Um, another thing could be attending grand rounds at your institution. They're usually publicly available. Um, so that's a great way to show effort. Um, there are also some other things like in, uh, getting involved with patient advocacy groups. Uh, so in graduate school, I volunteered for the Alzheimer's Association, and uh, that was a really great way of demonstrating that, you know, I do care for patients, even though uh, I wasn't working in uh, neuroscience at all. So um, definitely industry experience, um, clinical experience, and also they want some sort of evidence that you were a good networker. So what that usually means is, um, you know, connecting with other MSLs, if you, if you were able to get a referral, well, that means already that, you know, you're good at connecting with other MSLs, that you're good at talking to people. So some sort of thing that, um, you know, shows the hiring manager that you are, um, yeah, good at networking and uh, being open and able to um, um, build relationships with folks. So leadership positions at some of the, the clubs at your institution, that would be a good way as well. And that's a great um, list of activities that I think could get um, person flavor of what the job might entail and also look very appealing on a, on a resume. Um, and kind of adding on to that question, we have an audience member ask, were there certain skills that you kind of highlighted from your PhD training that you were able to use um, on the job or at least highlight in the interview setting? Yeah, there are, uh, I think, you know, a lot of things that you can highlight. Um, that being said, I do want to stress that um, when I'm, I was applying for MSL positions, my research did not come up a lot. So uh, definitely make sure uh, that you do not have an academic CV uh, prepared that you're applying with. So it has to be an industry oriented resume. So two pages, maybe three pages. I've seen that as well, but definitely keep it short. Um, something that I was never asked for are um, my publications. It, it just never came up in interviews and never, you know, came up during my field work. Um, so, you know, not something to focus on as well. And, um, you know, in your resume also do highlight that you did uh, other things than, you know, just being at your bench. So that's uh, very important. With that being said, I've from your research, there are a lot of, you know, lessons that you can take away, right? So um, make sure to stress that you were managing projects, research projects, several of them at the same time. Uh, you were also, um, you know, giving presentations on probably a weekly or a monthly basis at your uh, lab meetings. Uh, you were going to conferences where you were presenting your work. Uh, so you were uh, connecting with other uh, stakeholders there. Um, there are there are definitely you know a lot of things that you can highlight. So um, just make sure that you don't go into too much detail when it comes to you know your uh, research background. If the interviewer asks you, then perfect. But um, you know that that's not going to be all you're going to talk about. Great. Um, we also have a question that kind of touches back on the sales component. So we have a question about what are some questions that you um, most frequently find your ask, uh, yourself asking a sales rep as an MSL? And so we, we know that, um, as you mentioned in a previous answer, that there are certain compliance guidelines to uh, abide by. But in the interactions that you do have, what, what does that entail? So, um, you know, when you're working with your commercial colleagues in the field, I just do want to stress that that has to be a compliant relationship and um, that relationship will de be, be defined uh, differently from company to company. So um, I can tell you, you know, some of my experiences based on the companies that I've been with. Uh, so usually the way you will work with sales um, is for uh, introduction meetings. So they are great. Um, they're just a great resource for you to um, sort of get into the um, institutions that you're trying to get into and sort of um, meet providers that way. Um, so um, 
when you know in your interview when when they ask you how are you go you know what's your relationship going to be with sales just do uh, make sure to stress that uh, some of these individuals you know they've been in the field for years maybe decades so they know uh, sort of the lay of the land they know the providers and you need to make make sure that uh, you're going to highlight that you will take advantage of that so they can really make a lot of introductions for you they can make your life a lot easier so the way uh, that that works is just a sort of a symbiotic compliant relationship um also uh, you know when they have a uh, medical information request meaning a doctor is asking a question that's um you know off label or they're uh, requesting some sort of data clinical trial so they will they will uh, fill out what's called the medical information request that will get sent to you and you will be the one uh, talking to the provider about whatever it is they're asking. Uh, so basically it goes both ways. Great. Yeah, I think that's um, something really helpful for first buying MSLs to know um, going into an interview instead of while learning um, during the process itself. Excellent. Okay. Well, we have a really exciting news from a um, audience member who said, that they applied for an MSL job and passed the first interview round. Um, they have another interview next week, which is going to be a PowerPoint presentation. And they would like to ask for advice on um, going about this presentation um, style interview. Yeah, great question. And, um, you know, those uh, presentations are so important. So, if if uh, you are a first time um, MSL or an aspiring MSL, uh, so applying for your first role, that is definitely something that they're going to look at very closely, right? How do you present? Um, are you familiar with clinical terms as well as, you know, they already know that you're a good scientist, that they've seen that you have a PhD, um, they've seen that you've published, uh, you know, all of that. They don't need to worry about whether you'll catch up on the science. They just want to know whether you know how to present in an engaging uh, way, uh, whether you're familiar with clinical terms as well. So um, that's definitely something that, for example, I practiced with my mentors before it, I even started interviewing. And it was just really helpful um, to sort of see how those clinical pr presentations are broken down. Um, I also learned uh, a few, uh, you know, terms that I did not know and that I didn't learn during my PhD. For example, um, you know, if somebody asks you right now, uh, what's an intention to treat analysis, would you be able to answer that? You know, that's an important term to know before going in. So just um, little nuances like that. Um, it's just, it would be great to work with a mentor before you're interviewing, but if you are interviewing right now, definitely make sure to reach out to your MSL network and do a mock interview. Um, that's just going to help you a lot with your confidence. And also, you know, they're going to give you great advice um, as to, you know, what little things to change before your interview. So that's definitely my recommendation. Great. And um, good luck, Sharifa. Um, we um, hope to hear uh, how the next steps go. Okay, excellent. We have a question about um, specific background. So this person has um, medical laboratory diagnostic experience, and they were just wondering, um, does that count as clinical experience um, because they were working with clinical samples, or is there another way to, to talk about that experience? Yeah, I mean, definitely, um, definitely make sure to make that uh, experience relevant to the MSL role. If it was an in industry, uh, fantastic, uh, I would say. So, uh, you know, there, are, I, I don't know what the specifics of the role are, but uh, certainly if you've worked uh, with any sort of uh, clinics in your area or any providers that way, that would be great to highlight. If not, you know, you can always make the point that you know a lot about um, the diagnostic and the pharmaceutical process. Um, so, um, yeah, definitely a lot of things that you can highlight there. Great. Um, so we have a question a little bit about more um, of the role itself. And so what are some of the challenges 
or um, kind of um, obstacles that you might need to overcome in the initial stages of becoming an MSL and getting more acquainted with the role itself. Um, yeah, uh, so you cut out a little bit there, so okay. I, I didn't catch everything, so, but yeah, uh, the is the question. Challenges. Yeah, challenges. challenges. Okay. okay. Well, mm -hmm. so, yes, you know, when you're trans transitioning to being uh, an MSL from academia, it's obviously a very different role. So there will be some challenges. Um, certainly, building your network is one of them. Uh, so uh, that will be something that we'll ask you in your interview for sure. If you are a first time MSL, you know, how are you going to develop your network? How are you going to access difficult institutions or difficult KOLs? Um, so that will be a little bit of a challenge when you're starting out. Um, definitely, um, you know, uh, the senior people at your company will work with you to mentor you to try to uh, and you will get better uh, as time goes. So. Um, you know, there are uh, tricks to the trade that they will share with you. So um, when you're building your, net your network as a first time of MSL, you know, it's, it's important to be persistent. And uh, what you'll communicate during your interview is that uh, during your research, uh, you had to be really persistent. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have completed your research projects. So many times you've had obstacles, you know, you've had uh, experiments that failed. But what you did is you went to the neighboring lab and you asked for your for advice. Uh, you went uh, to your committee and you you know um you ask for advice how to how to um, overcome that obstacle so that's basically the same thing you'll be doing as an msl so you'll try to access the kol they won't be available so what will you do you'll you look at some sort of creative options you go you'll go to a conference where where they're speaking speaking and you'll meet them that way. If not, you know, you're, you'll ask your sales representative to make an introduction for you, or you'll find a clinical research co coordinator at that is institution that will sort of be a gateway to the KOL or a physician assistant at that office. So do try to make your previous ex experience relevant um, to, you know, being an MSL. So it takes a little bit of cre creativity, but definitely possible. Okay, so persistence is key when applying and uh, yeah. in the role itself, which is um, a great point to remember. Okay, so we have a question that touches upon one of the, the central topics of today of how do you personally define mm -hmm. your success as an MSL and also kind of the flip side of how your team or your company might define success uh, within the, the position? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, um, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to think about that if you're not an MSL already. So, you know, for example, we talked about sales a great deal and they have obviously numbers that they're trying to reach um, because they're a, com a commercial and promotional. Um, but as an MSL, it might be a little bit hard to quantify, uh, you know, what you're doing. So a lot of the companies uh, have what's called metrics, and they have a defined, um, you know, number of interactions that you should be having each month. So there should be meaningful interactions that generate insights that you can take back to your company. Um, you know, some companies do really focus a lot on that number. Sometimes it's just sort of a guideline for you, but not really a strict um, a strict goal. Uh, there are also a lot of qualitative things that, um, you know, the managers will definitely uh, look at and that's how they will evaluate you. So a lot of the times as an MSL, uh, you do so you can, you know, work with uh, clinical trials that are ongoing and you might be a lead for that. Um, you might be a lead for any sort of scientific updates on the disease state. So uh, whenever something new comes up, you'll bring that to the team and you'll educate everyone on that. Um, you might even be uh, training your commercial colleagues. Um, so some companies do that uh, where you'll sort of explain all the signs to them that um, they might not, you know, use it in the field if it's off label, but just for their own knowledge or, um, you know, talk, teach them about the disease state as well. Um, you can lead advisory boards. Um, 
uh, yeah, there are, you know, a lot of other side projects that you will for sure be doing, maybe not in your first year as an MSL, but definitely as time goes on. Um, so all of that is sort of taken together and that's how you're evaluated. That's great. Okay, excellent. We have um, another question about, uh, I think you've touched upon experiences that an academic um, can do to kind of touch upon um, clinical experience. And so what was the best way that you displayed that um, kind of in the resume setting or even just during your network that led to um, a potential next interview? So how did you kind of market all the, the crucial experiences that you were um, previously mentioning? Yeah, so the way I did that actually, so, uh, you know, I knew I needed clinical experience. And when I was talking to one of the MSL mentors uh, that I was meeting with regularly, you know, I said, okay, um, how do I get clinical experience? You know, it's not part of my PhD program, but I need, I know I need something on the resume. And, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily be a clinical research coordinator when I graduate. I'd kind of like to just, um, get that uh, clinical experience while I'm in school. So he said, and I still remember it, he's like, well, just volunteer. You're at Baylor, right? So th that's basically what I did. Um, I found uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, there was a clinical trials website and all of the investigators were listed. And what I literally did, I emailed all of them with my resume and I said, hey, um, you know, I'm really interested in a clinical career after I graduate. Could I just sort of uh, uh, volunteer with you? You know, I'm happy to help out with whatever you need. And I, I would really be interested in shadowing you as well. So um, I did have one investigator uh, write back and he was a great, he became a great mentor. So uh, some of the things I did, you know, I attended the meetings where uh, they would talk about the clinical trials they have going on. Um, also, uh, I helped out with writing some IRB protocols. So that was really helpful, you know, to actually get some sort of, uh, I guess, regulatory uh, experience with clinical trials. And uh, I did meet a bunch of physicians in that group, and some of, some of them uh, did let me uh, shadow them. So that was just very, I don't know, as a PhD student who was, you know, in lab all the time, it was so cool to see things from a clinical perspective and actually see patients and uh, how they treat them. So um, if anything, it'll help you, you know, decide whether a clinical career is right for you. So I definitely encourage you just because it's not a part of your program doesn't mean that uh, you can't make it happen. So. Right. That's a very, very uh, wonderful experience that you kind of created out of um, kind of nothing. And uh, that's, uh, I think, the, the creativity and persistence that um, is required. Um, that's great to hear. Okay, excellent. We have a question about um, kind of the territories that you've served in the past, how big they are, and what kind of travel um, do, uh, does that entail for um, kind of meeting the needs of that size territory? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's a very important one um, because it will really define your lifestyle, and you you just sort of need to make sure that you're aware of how territory you know assignment works, and also like with the therapeutic area, um, how that's going to be incorporated in your lifestyle. So, do you have the ability to cover a certain territory um, or a therapeutic area? So, let's say that you're in New York City, you're living in New York City and you want to be an MSL. So probably I'd say chances are more than 90% is that you'll be covering New York City alone. So, you know, unless you're at a conference, you probably won't need to travel by air at all. So um, that's just one example. Uh, if you're on the West Coast, so for example, before uh, coming here to the East Coast, I was in Denver and my territory was all the way from California uh, to Colorado. So as you can imagine, that was a lot of flying, right? Almost every week um, I was flying somewhere and meeting with providers in a different state. So that obviously was a lot of traveling. Um, 
So uh, just, you know, make sure that you, you know, you obviously know what your situation is, your family situation, and just plan accordingly. Uh, for example, Sonia is at AMD Anderson and she's in Houston. And let's say that she wants to be an oncology MSL. So, you know, what, what do you think would happen in that situation? Well, she'd probably be covering MD Anderson alone, uh, you know, maybe a little bit outside that, uh, maybe, you know, the whole Houston area, but that's about about it. So it's because there are a lot of KOLs situated in that area. So just make sure that, you know, you think about that, think about that strategy when you're applying. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. And I'm, I'm sure these are things that uh, the hiring team would love to discuss even further too, so you can get a better idea. Um, that's great. So we have a question about um, your experience from going from a smaller pharmaceutical or biotech company to larger companies, and how did your roles and MSL and responsibilities change within those two settings? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know the answer will vary from company to company so i just i just want to say that i will speak in general terms when i say small or large company but uh, there are definitely exceptions uh, to this and i've uh, had msl friends who have had very different experience uh, experiences than i have so usually what happens is that in smaller companies um you might have heard this before, you'll wear a lot of hats. Uh, so um, you'll have many more uh, projects. Um, so, some people also say you'll have more opportunities for growth. I think that's a little bit debatable. Um, so, you know, um, obviously smaller companies, they do have a tighter budget and um, there are some responsibilities that will um, come with that. So they might not have a lot of, uh, you know, resources at their disposal when it comes to building your network. Um, so maybe, you know, um, in a large company, uh, there are so many people that can just introduce you uh, to someone when, when you need to get a hold of someone, right? So you might have um, sales representatives, uh, professional engagement managers, um, thought leader liaisons, um, all of these roles that can just help you out and so many ways so usually in smaller companies um, it's a little bit harder because uh, you're just more independent uh, with that being said um, sometimes you do wear a lot of hats and you have a lot of projects and some people really like that so um, when i transitioned out of uh, grad school you know it was a really great environment for me to be in uh, just because i think it really allowed me to get out of my comfort zone and um, sort of transition to industry and not just you know, as an MSL, I was doing a lot of other things. So I was um, actually training other MSLs and I was really involved in uh, like the clinical research. So I was a lead for some of the clinical trials. So it did allow me to get a lot of exposure, if you will. Uh, large companies, I think, um, for MSLs who are starting out are really great. Um, you do get a lot of guidance. Uh, you usually have like a two month or a three month um, training period where you really get trained on the role, on the data. So it's just kind of a more, um, I guess, a smoother transition, if you will. Um, but uh, larger companies, you know, they also have a lot of resources. So um, if, if you have sort of a, a path in mind for your career, um, they usually can make that happen. You, you just talk to your manager and make a plan. Um, so in general, I would say that they are very stable. And as far as uh, mentorship and your professional growth, um, I, I've seen a lot of MSLs definitely benefit from larger companies. It's great to hear um, great to hear the pros of both both sides and, and what to look out for. Okay. So we have a question about um, specific certificates. Um, that are associated with the, the MSL field and what your kind of viewpoint is on if that's uh, helpful to um, do when you're applying for um, positions or do you have any other opinion on those certificates? Yeah, good question. And, you know, I didn't really know the answer when I was applying. So I did have 
uh, one certificate that might be still on my LinkedIn. I'm not sure if I removed it. Um, it was from an MSL alliance that was associated with the Cheeky Scientists organization. I did think, you know, being a part of a group like that was very helpful. So I started, um, I joined that group when uh, I was in, also in my second year of graduate school. So I was just sort of uh, passively, I guess, uh, trying to, um, it, or, you know, retain information from all, all the MSLs like a, like a sponge. Um, so they would have like mock interviews in the group. Uh, they would uh, also make you do videos where you sort of answer um, questions like you would in an interview. For example, um, you know, introduce yourself, uh, tell me about a situation where you had to overcome an obstacle, you know, um, how would you build your MSL network, how would you work with a difficult KOL, so that was really cool, I did definitely learn a lot, but when it comes to actually, you know, somebody asking me about that certificate, I don't think anybody ever did when I was interviewing, uh, I'll have to be honest, so, um, you know, what, what's really important is that you can already sort of speak like an MSL, that you have a good understanding of what the role is. And, you know, that would be a great thing for us to cover, actually, what you would say, um, what's an MSL. So, um, um, you know, they'll, they'll definitely be able to tell whether you are prepared for the role. And, um, you know, if a hiring manager really likes that you have a certificate, maybe they do notice it on your LinkedIn, on your resume, like that's great, that's a bonus. But I don't think that's really gonna make it or break it for you, so. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Um, we have a follow-up question to the, the clinical presentation um, within an MSL interview. And the question is asking um, if they've, if an academic is not, uh, does not have experience ever presenting to a clinician, what things should they have in mind when presenting scientific data? Um, they were asking about specific terminology to use. Do you focus on trial endpoints, efficacy, things like that, and really cut down the science? Is there any way that uh, especially a PhD should, um, things that they should keep in mind to do, to be more clinically relevant um, in their presentation? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, so first of all, you'll get an invitation for an interview. Uh, it'll say specifically what they want you to do. Um, usually, you will get a phase three paper and it'll be up to you to make the presentation. You'll usually get a time limit. And, you know, uh, when the time comes, uh, you'll present and then they'll ask you questions uh, related to the study, maybe some, uh, some other questions like star based questions as well. Um, sometimes I've heard it. I've never experienced that. They'll actually give you a slide deck that they want you to present. Um, so, and again, I've never I've had an interview like that. I, I know that uh, it does happen sometimes, and I think that's much easier, right, if you already have a slide deck uh, and you can just sort of present the slides. But let's imagine that's not the case. So you get a phase three paper, and where do you go, go from there? So usually the time limit will be about 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, it's not, you know, your thesis. You're not going to be able to talk forever. You'll just have to get the main points across, and they'll actually make sure to track whether you've gone over because because that's not actually a good thing when you're talking to a provider you don't want to lose their uh, focus so uh something that i would do i would get uh, an invite and then i would try to make about i would say 10 to 15 slides have also some supplemental slides uh, try to expect questions as well um, but um, the way i would break it down first of all I would talk about the disease state in about one to two slides. I think that's very important. You never know who's going to be at the interview. Um, you know, it just really uh, sort of helps you um, communicate that you're a subject matter expert. If somebody is there from a non-scientific department like HR, um, you do want to make sure that you cover some relevant information so they can sort of keep up. Um, one thing I did include, uh, sorry, before the disease state, I would always have an introduction slide as well. And the, you know, it, it's just really nice if you can sort of um, make a personal connection with the panel. So just 
you know, put a nice professional photo of you and then um, just a little bit about your background, where you went to school, um, what are some of the important roles that you did. If you, that's a great way to sort of uh, highlight any industry experience or clinical experience that you've had. Just, just make sure that that's on the slide. And then just friendly introduce yourself. Uh, you might even throw in a sentence that sort of makes you human, um, throw in a hobby or um, anything that you like to do in a free in your free time. Then you go on to the Z state, as I said, one to two slides. Then you talk about the clinical tri uh, clinical trial study design, just briefly, and then you go into the endpoints. Um, so some things that are really important to uh, highlight. Uh, so think about it from a patient perspective. So you're not thinking about it from a PhD perspective anymore. Think about it. If I was a doctor, what what did I what would I want to know about this trial? And then you sort of go from there. So just make sure to put it all into a patient perspective, and um, don't just focus on the numbers, right? And in our PhD, we would always just talk about percentages, and you know this protein binds to this protein, and um, we sort of make it maybe a little more cold, and you know this. Uh, you probably don't need you don't need to say what the endpoints are even like just um, communicate it in a way that's clinically relevant if that makes sense and then at the end I would sort of have a discussion slide where I would talk about uh, advantages or, or, or limitations to the study and like what this means for a real world real world treatment. That's great. There's a lot of um, really good pieces of advice in there, and um, we hope our audience can can utilize that as they move through those interview rounds. Okay, we have um, a question that comes up often of if you would like to apply to an MSL position outside of your normal therapeutic area that you were either trained in or you received your degree in, what is your best piece of advice in kind of convincing a hiring manager to, to um, that you are a good fit? Yeah, um, great question. And, you know, I can definitely talk about that because uh, my PhD was in uh, liver gene therapy and I ended up working in dermatology. So it definitely is possible to completely switch therapeutic areas. <clears throat> and I would uh, say, you know, don't limit yourself unless you really know that there's a therapeutic area you're really passionate about. You know, if you just want to do oncology and th that's it, you just can't imagine yourself doing anything else. If you just are trying to break into the MSL role, then definitely do not limit yourself. And you never know, you might really end up enjoying um, working in a different therapeutic area. For example, I really love dermatology. I don't know that I could see myself um, going away from uh, derm, um, you know, maybe at some point, but not right now. Uh, so it's definitely possible. And, um, you know, um, as I said, uh, you, you're if you're a PhD, if you have a terminal scientific degree of any kind, they know that you'll be able to catch up on the science. What they're really looking for, trying to, what they're trying to gauge is if you're a good networker, if, you know, you and I sat down right now, would you be able to um, build some sort of relationship with me? You know, would I really enjoy speaking with you? Would you be open? Would you be engaging? Uh, would you be able to um, make me interested in your data, you know? So uh, they'll look at that. Uh, and then of course there's a checklist. So they'll look at industry clinical experience and that's gonna be, I think more relevant than your actual therapeutic area of background. Um, that being said, I've heard that some hiring managers uh, are very adamant about you having some sort of background. So uh, if that's the case, they'll usually let you know right away. And, um, you know, if, if you've done your research and let's say GI and you're uh, interviewing for a GI role, then, yeah, definitely make sure to each conversation, you know, let them know, hey, um, I'm really a subject matter expert. I've done, I've published, you know, four papers on this. 
Um, I, I've attended many national conferences and I've actually been a speaker on this topic. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's really up to you, but definitely you, you can switch therapeutic areas. Really encouraging to know. And it definitely expands. Um, I miss. Excellent. Okay, so we have um, two questions that I'm going to kind of combine into one. Um, asking about your opinions on the need to use recruiters, um, if you're kind of trying to apply to several roles and not really hearing anything, and also um, for those who don't have previous MSL experience, is there certain job titles to kind of look out for? Um, yeah, so, you know, working with recruiters, um, I'd say my experience is pretty limited. Uh, I haven't actually used, uh, I've talked to several recruiters. There's never, I've never actually used them uh, as far as um, none of the roles that I've uh, received uh, were through a recruiter, let's just say that. So uh, when I was applying right out of graduate school, I found that, and I think most people will find this is pretty common knowledge that recruiters might not be you know as uh, eager to speak with you i mean if you think about it um, this is their uh, bread and butter you know this is how they make money and obviously if uh, i need to uh, if i know that somebody's a very experienced msl and you know my my chances of uh, uh, this person getting the role uh, might be you know 85%, whereas if you're in academia right now, uh, I know that my chances might be right 5% or 10%. So not really, you know, uh, a great uh, percentage there. So I would say if you're trying to transition, uh, you know, do talk to them if they reach out to you. Uh, definitely, uh, I know that some first time MSLs have worked with a recruiter, um, maybe they would be a better resource, ask them which specific recruiter it was. Um, and then you know that they're willing with first time MSLs. And I know that, you know, they have a, I mean, they probably have so uh, much advice that they can give you on interviewing, on uh, how to compose your resume, uh, you know, what to, what to say, what not to say. So um, if you see that they're willing to work with you, great, 100% uh, go for it. Just do not waste a lot of time, you know, trying to send out LinkedIn messages to recruiters and trying to connect with them. Um, th that's just my personal experience. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so we have a question about if you could share any highlights uh, or areas that you really enjoy um, during the course of your MSL career thus far. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that I enjoy, especially when you look at, you know, my background. So uh, as I said, um, I was a PhD student at one time and, um, you know, uh, Something that I was missing every day, I was just in the cell culture room or in the mouse room, right, injecting mice. Um, it was just a very, uh, you know, it can be exciting. I think basic research can be exciting. And obviously it's, it's, it's how everything starts uh, for us, right? That's how therapies are discovered uh, at the bench. So certainly nothing against that. It's just that the lifestyle was a little monotonous for me. Um, I felt like it was pretty repetitive as well. And now as an MSL, you know, I, um, I get to travel a lot. So I get to meet new people. Um, I'm never uh, every week, you know, I might be at, in a different uh, place meeting different people. So that's really exciting. Just that dynamic aspect of it you know not um you don't have like the same day over and over um so that's just my personal preference and also you know i've, I've learned a lot once you sort of become invested in the therapeutic area you'll really um you know you'll know the challenges that the patients face and you'll you'll it'll sort of sort of become your personal mission and you'll meet the providers as well and the you know you'll get really close to them as time goes on so i would say as a career if you're thinking about it uh, you know will it be gratifying or not um I, I just i couldn't imagine you know doing anything else so um 
definitely something uh, to consider when you're applying for roles, right? How much will you actually enjoy it? That's really, really wonderful to hear and hopefully very motivating for, for all of our audience members. Okay, as we're coming close to the hour, um, we would like to ask uh, another question regarding um, what is usually the general career trajectory for an MSL? What are the other roles that kind of are adjacent um, and how do they compare to the MSL? And, and if you have personal insight on uh, how would you like to um, kind of construct your, your own career trajectory? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to answer right now just because, uh, you know, I've been in MSL for two years and I just really don't see myself moving away from from this. Um, but um, there are a lot of things that um, you'll be exposed to as an MSL. Obviously, you're part of the medical affairs team, meaning that um, you'll work with, uh, for example, medical directors that are working on different studies. Um, you're you're going to be working with other departments as well. So marketing, um, you know, the clinical research team, the regulatory team. So it'll give you a lot of exposure into other industry uh, careers as well. If you feel like maybe a medical career is not something that you want to pursue. Um, I've seen people transition to obviously becoming an MSL manager is a pretty obvious one, right? Um, so becoming a medical director as well, where, where you really uh, are more, um, I guess, uh, focused on the science and the clinical trials and thinking about the medical strategy from that perspective. Um, but you can also, you know, always uh, transition to other departments. I have seen people go to marketing, for example, so just a completely different department. So there are options um as well that's great well it's a wonderful way to kind of wrap up everything we discussed about the msl role and where it could take you in in the following years after that so i like to say um thank you so so much um to our speaker today dr anika fury this is so many pieces of very, very helpful advice. And uh, a big thank you to our audience members who were very engaged. Um, and I hope you got it a lot out of this hour. We are recording this, as I mentioned. So if you'd like to play it back and really kind of stop and take some extra notes, we'll be emailing out the link um, to this um, webinar. So thank you all for attending. Um, as we mentioned, each webinar Feel free to connect with us um, on LinkedIn, um, follow our LinkedIn page. We keep doing this every single month and we, we're, again, very thankful for, for our speaker's time. So um, we, we hope you come back next month as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I just do want to say if there's something we haven't covered, right, we could be talking for 10 more hours. <laughs> uh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn and, you know, we'll set up a time to chat. Thank you so much. We, we really, really appreciate 